because in a brown paper bag. And they would uh, tell you this. Oh, they yeah. Would I this to you. Uh, oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. It was like, oh, well, you can't come in because, you know, you're too dark. And it's like, oh, okay. Like, it's the culture. You know it. It's, it, it exists in the fabric of where I, where I was, right? Mm -hmm. um, the worst of it, though, for me came when I had a family member. And, you know, everyone, when you're growing up, I don't know if it's everyone in the South or just people in general, but sometimes you may get a nickname. Yeah. But my nickname was the worst of all for me because my nickname was... Hey, hey, everyone. Let's start healing. I'm Adrian Murchison and welcome to episode 63 of the Let's Start Healing podcast. We have more in common than we think and what we have in common can change the world. I have a really important and powerful episode for you today. Very rich, very rich. Actress Taja V. Simpson is here with me today. Uh, Taja, I will tell you about her in a moment, but you'll know her from The Oval. If you watch Tyler Perry's The Oval, you will know her as Priscilla Owens. But Taja is here today to talk about a chapter in the upcoming book, Women Who Shine, a collection of 30 stories written by women authors in Kate Butler's Inspired Impact book series. And her chapter is on colorism. Colorism is something that she experienced early in her life into adulthood. And it's a prejudice within the black community. And it's something that is not talked about enough. I'm going to read you a definition, which I really want to get to the quote after this definition that I found in the Oxford Dictionary, and the definition of colorism is prejudice or discrimination against individuals with a dark skin tone, typically among people of the same ethnic or racial group. Colorism within the black community has been a serious emotional and psychological battle. And as I said, it's something that is not talked about enough in the black community it goes right back to slavery. And I mean, just like we can say racism obviously goes right back to slavery, so does colorism and the way that we can treat each other in the black community. Taja, she's so powerful. She shares experiences that she had growing up and how that really affected her deeply and how she had to overcome these perceptions and this these wounds really inside that these outside perceptions created. Taja, as I mentioned, is currently in the series, The Oval. She's also going to be in uh, this final season of Insecure. She can be seen in All American. She was in an episode of Grey's Anatomy. She's been on NCIS, The Bold and the Beautiful. Her resume is quite long and you're really going to enjoy listening to her as she just brings up uh, some very poignant, powerful, painful experiences. As I said, she'll discuss some spiritual breakthroughs and other things she'll talk about includes how she became a working actress. She is a native of Lake Charles, Louisiana. And uh, she was just a joy to talk to. And I'm just grateful that she was willing to be so revealing. Before we get to Taja, I want to remind you that you can listen to Let's Start Healing on traditional podcast platforms. And that includes Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and our podcast YouTube channel. And remember, whatever platform you listen on, please subscribe to the podcast. I have talked to some really amazing guests since we launched in 2019, and I have more great episodes coming your way. So, Taja, let's meet her, let's get started, and let's start healing. Welcome, Taja. 
Thank you. <laughs> it's so wonderful to have you on the podcast and thank you so much for doing this. Absolutely. I'm excited. I was excited all day about this interview. Oh, really? Why, mm -hmm. why were you so excited? I love it. Why were you so excited? Um, because when you first contacted me, like you, you do your research and you look up the, the podcast or information and things like that. I love that. Um, there's a spiritual groundedness to it. I'm, I'm a Christian. That's my, you know, my faith, my belief. So it was just an opportunity to talk about my life, my experiences. Thank if that you. helps someone else, then it's like, why not? That's what made me want to be excited about being on your podcast today. It. Thank yeah. you so much. Now, where are you right now? Are you in LA? I'm in, I'm in LA. Mm -hmm. okay. I live in LA. And you're from St. Charles, Louisiana? I'm from Lake Charles, Louisiana. And I like to say I'm from the real LA. Just want to put that out there. <laughs> But yes, I'm originally from Lake Charles, Louisiana, born and raised, went to, you know, elementary, junior high, high school and college right oh, there in Lake wow. Charles, Louisiana. Yeah. My brother uh, lives in Slidell. <laughs> He's been there oh, okay. for well over 30 years, maybe 40 years. Wow. He yeah. loves it then. Yes. It's home for him. It's home. It's for home. Him. Yeah. Yeah. So you have <laughs> an upcoming book coming out. Um, you, you have a chapter with 30 other authors in a book, Women Who Shine. I understand it's coming out in June. Is that right? Yes. The Kate mm -hmm. Butler book series. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I would love to talk about the chapter that you wrote and if you could yeah. share a bit about it. Yeah, absolutely. So, man, this chapter, it was like a purging session for me. It was a healing session for me. It was something that I knew I, I was going to talk about at some point, but I used to say, oh, I'll save that for Oprah. Oh, that'll be my <laughs> big Oprah interview, you know? <laughs> um, but, you know, God works in mysterious ways. So my chapter deals with colorism mm -hmm. and my experiences in dealing with that growing up a young child in Louisiana. It starts off talking about, you know, when I was just a young child, five and under, six, seven and under, um, no matter where I went, I was always made to feel less than because of the color of my skin. There was this thing called the paper bag test, the brown paper bag test. If you were darker than a brown paper bag, then you weren't able to go to people's homes, get in certain clubs. Um, you were treated very differently. Mm -hmm. And all of that was very apparent, but it was also the culture of the time. So in my chapter, I really tried to paint the picture of the culture as if you're watching a movie and it's a period piece. Yeah. And then you understand it a little bit more versus looking at this from a 2021 mind being like, what? You know, you can't relate to it, right? But as I was growing up, I couldn't play with kids down the street because I was darker than the brown paper bag test. Little boys or guys as I got older didn't want to date me because I was, you know, darker than a brown paper bag. And they would um, tell you this. Oh, they yeah. They this to you. Uh, oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. It was like, oh, well, you can't come in because, you know, you're too dark. And it's like, oh, okay. It's the culture. You know it. It's, it exists in the fabric of where I was, right? Mm -hmm. um, the worst of it, though, for me came when I had a family member. And, you know, everyone, when you're growing up, I don't know if it's everyone in the South or just people in general, but sometimes you may get a nickname. Yeah. But my nickname was the worst of all for me because my nickname was Ugly Thing. So she would call me like, yeah, like, yeah, oh, get away from me. Oh, she's ugly. She's black. Uh, and if she was calling me from another room or calling me, she never used my name. She would always say, ugly thing, ugly thing, come here. Wow. And Who I, would do I this? No, a family member. Uh-huh. A family member. And so I would see her on summers and holidays and, you know, things like that. And it would just tear me up inside because yeah. all I wanted was as this little brown girl, you know, growing up in Louisiana was for my aunt and family to love me. But in hindsight, when I look at it, I'm like, wow, this was everywhere. This was in my inner workings. This was in my neighborhood. This was in my school. This was happening everywhere. I was bullied because I was so dark. I was called kind of names because I was so dark. It was all these different things. And so I had to find a way to cope because my skin color wasn't changing. Mm -hmm. I remember a prayer that I used to sit in the tub and pray to God like very often. I would pray to him to ask him to make me lighter. And I would just say, God, if you could just make me just a little bit lighter, then people will get off of me. They won't be, they won't be like on me so much. I won't get bullied so much. My aunt would love me. And I'm not even asking for a lot, Lord. I'm just asking for the color that's in between the knuckles on your hand because typically the color in between your knuckles and your hand when you have melanin is lighter than the actual knuckle. And so in my brain as this six-year-old child, right, I'm thinking, oh my God, if we could just do that, then I'll be good. That's all I need. I'm, I don't even want to make it too drastic because I don't, I don't want people to notice and then that becomes a thing. That never happened, right? 
So I had to learn how to cope and deal with kind of like living under the radar. Like I didn't want to wear bright colors because that would make me stand out. And then if I stood out, then I was getting bullied. Girl, you too black. You can't wear orange. Girl, you, I can't believe she got that pink on over to look like a bugaboo or whatever. You know, was, was it's like you ever, couldn't. Was there ever one once in a while would you encounter someone who would tell you that you are beautiful? Well, my parents, yes. Uh-huh. My parents were my foundation in the you can do anything. You're beautiful. My mom would call me her chocolate star. My parents were always, you know, encouraging and uplifting in that way. The problem then becomes that's all you get. Those only two people in a vast world of where you live and you are a product of your environment, I believe. Yeah. So I'm getting it from, you know, my sister is, is very light skinned. My aunt loved her way more than me. She's light skinned. She called her her albino baby because she was so light. Oh, that's my albino baby. Oh, come here. She would come in, bring her gifts and throw me over to the side. So it was a lot of that. So yes, I did have my parents countering that, but it's hard to, as you're trying to develop as a young child and grow into a young teenager and adolescent, and you're trying to tell yourself these other things about yourself, but the world is telling you something different. Yeah. You yeah. know what I mean? Um, I, I would do. date, I would date guys and, you know, like, you know, junior high, high school, when you're getting to know somebody on the phone and all that kind of stuff. And every single time they'd be like, man, it's the first time I've ever been on the phone with a dark skinned girl. Like, wow. Like, it's the thing. I'm like, oh, <laughs> wow. Wow. wow that we, we, we keep count. Okay. I always said, though, if I had a dark, if I had a dark, you know, she was going to have to be cold, you know, so man, so, you know, how you doing? You know, I just be like, wow, this is, <laughs> but it happened so often that it all, it made me be like, okay, well, let me just stay under the radar here. Let me not do too much to stand out. If you go above or below the middle road, you're standing out. Mm-hmm. So I had to figure out how to cope and deal with the skin that I'm in and not be so boisterous and over the top because then it's like I'm standing out, but not be so quiet and timid that it's like you get picked on still for that. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So it was like trying to find the middle ground and be comfortable in my own skin. But at the same time, I'm very aware yeah. that I'm dark. The world is telling me. There's so many different moments in my life that I remember being out with a friend and this friend of mine, we used to live down the street from one another and we looked a lot alike. We were the same size, roughly the same, same skin tone. We did everything together. And one day we were, we were out somewhere and people thought we were sisters. And this lady was like, are you guys sisters? And we were like, no, we're friends. But we get that all the time. The lady goes, okay, because you guys look so much alike. And then my friend said, yeah, but she way darker than me. I'm not that dark. Like we may look alike, but I'm not that dark. And then in that moment, it was like, oh, I didn't even realize. Okay, I guess I am that much dark. I guess I am much darker than you. Okay. And then it's like all these things that would happen along yeah. the way in life yeah. that even when I'm not thinking about it, somebody's throwing it up in your face to make right. you remember. Even when I'm just out and about and living life, if it's something that's around that's going to remind me, you're less than, you're not enough. But you know, the thing is, is that you're not less than, you mm-hmm. know? Like you said a minute ago, they would make you very aware that you're dark, like that's a bad mm-hmm. thing, you know? Oh, absolutely. It, that's so amazing. I guess I'm just, uh, even a gazillion years ago when I was in college, because I'm mm-hmm. from upstate New York, from Buffalo, New York. Okay. And I'm in Atlanta. I went to college in Atlanta. Mm-hmm. And I don't feel that I experienced or was aware of colorism until mm-hmm. I came south. There you go. Even with it existing, I would think that it would have existed, you know, so many years before and not be mm-hmm. something that has gone on mm-hmm. in recent years. It's, it's crazy. It's crazy. So how did you begin to make a shift for yourself and come to a real awareness of your beauty? (sighs) Let's see. I graduated college. I moved to Houston, Texas. And when I went to Texas, I was meeting a different type of people. Mm -hmm. People in Texas were from all over. And I started to notice that people that I would meet that weren't from the South, that are from maybe the Midwest or the East Coast, or even the West, they're not looking at me as a dark-skinned girl first, per se. I'm not mm-hmm. made to feel that way. And I remember this guy that I met who ended up being a really good friend of mine. He used to compliment me on like my nose and my lips and my features and my skin tone. And he was the first guy that I remember getting those types of compliments from. Now I would get, oh, you're pretty for a dark-skinned girl. I would get or sometimes just you're pretty. Oh, wow. Okay, thank you. Sometimes the compliment will come out and I'm like waiting for the phrase yeah. for a dark skinned girl. You know yeah. what I mean? Um, but here was a guy that was complimenting me on all the things that I didn't like about myself. I didn't like my nose. I didn't like my lips. They were too full. 
I like my skin tone, but he was just like, wow, you are just like amazing. And I'm like, what, boy, get, well, get out of here. But he poured into me so much that now I'm in, you know, a young adult. I'm in my, I'm in like 21, 22. I'm in that era of my life. And I'm, I'm still very aware. Like, I don't want to be in the sun too long because I may get too dark. I'm still very aware that when I go in rooms, oh my God, I'm the only dark skinned person in the room. Is that a thing? Mm. I'm still very aware of all these different things subconsciously in the back of my mind, even though I'm living this very, what seems like confident life. Yeah. Because what I started to do was live under the facade of I'm okay, right? Mm -hmm. I did it so much, I believed it. Yeah. So when I got to that part of my life, the world was giving me different energy. I think that's when I started to look inside myself and be like, okay. I was 25 years old when I finally accepted what I looked like. I was 30 years old when I was finally comfortable in my own skin. Mm -hmm. but it took 30 years for me to be like, okay, then I had to deal with the work that I thought that I dealt with when I was younger with my family member and all the stuff I had gone through. But I, what I realized I had just passed it down. Yeah. I just passed it down. I hadn't fully dealt with the wounds of it. Yeah. So when I would talk about the story with a family member to maybe a friend or something, if we're sharing stories about upbringings or what have you, yeah. I couldn't speak about it without crying. Mm -hmm. that's when I knew it still affected me, but I hadn't dealt with it. I hadn't thought about it in so many years, but if yeah. every time it came up, I was so emotional about it. And that made me be like, okay, I have to unpack that a little bit more. And so that led me to the journey of realizing I had self work to do. I didn't know I had self work to do until then. What was the work that you did? Was it a matter of just, you know, letting yourself feel the pain so it could dissipate? Yeah. So I realized, I had to speak about it. I had to talk mm -hmm. about it. I had to get it out of me. I had to, yeah. I had to no longer be ashamed of it. I was so ashamed. Ugh, Jesus. I was so ashamed. I never wanted to tell anyone. I wanted to keep this little secret in a box, you know, locked deep, deep away in the back part of my soul. And nobody would even know that I went through that because I tried so hard to get over it. But I realized I have to let it go. I have to bring it out. So then I started talking about it more. I talked to my parents about it. I, I talked to maybe a boyfriend at the time about it. I started talking about it. And then that started giving me a little bit of healing, a little bit of healing, a little bit of healing. To the point where I thought I was great. I was like, okay, I've been doing the work. Okay, I've been um, allowing that to come out. I've been telling myself different things about myself. So I would have a new belief about me. Mm -hmm. um, but the part that, of my life that really changed for me was when I was engaged. And that's such a whole nother story. I don't know how much time we got, honey. But, that's <laughs> a, but, <laughs> but I was engaged and beautiful whirlwind. It was like a fantasy. It was like, oh my God, we went to Hawaii for my birthday and I had no idea he was going to propose to me and he did. And it was just like, what? It was just like the perfect yeah. everything. We came back, we were getting a place to get, we got this beautiful condo together. And then shortly thereafter, he decided this isn't what he wanted for his life anymore. And he left me. I was devastated. Wow. And How long had I, you been together? Almost like a year. That was when I was at the lowest of the lowest of the low, right? So now I'm like, here it is. I finally think I got it right. I finally feel like, oh, I got the man of my dreams. I'm living life. How I, okay, this feels good. But then when he left, I realized it brought up all these other feelings from the little, little young girl who sat in a tub that would feel like it's her fault that this is happening to her. Yeah. So then I'm like, okay, I can't keep doing the same thing and expecting different results. We know that's the exact definition of insanity. So I was like, I have to shake some things up in my life. I cannot keep doing the same thing because I never, I will never be here again. Yeah. And that was the darkest part of my life, but it birthed the best parts and the best version of me. Mm -hmm. from there is when I really started to dissect and get into personal growth to personal development. And that's when I started put doing the practical steps that it would take for me to not only love me, but be super confident and absolutely proud of the skin that I'm in. Not just 80%, not just 90%, but like 100, you know, right. but I started with affirmations. And the first day I looked in the mirror and I said, I am beautiful. I am worthy. I am enough burst into tears. Yeah. I never looked in the mirror and said those things, those things to my to myself with that type of intention ever. Yeah. Yeah. And then that's that broke me. And then I just started putting in the work. I changed my vernacular. I changed everything about my speech. My circle 
changed a bit because I was now changing and evolving and growing in, in a very, you know, powerful way. I became this master manifester. I believe your words are your wands. I believe your thoughts become your things. All these things that we learn about, that's still Bible. You yeah. have to speak life over your life, not death. You have to ask yourself, the choice is yours. You want life or you want, the, what do you want? Yeah. You know, I had to really dissect that, the words and what I was saying and how it applied to my life and the intention behind it. And from doing so, that was birthing this whole new woman that you see now that mm -hmm. I can actually sit here and talk to you about this. Mm -hmm. Because up three years ago, four years ago, I wouldn't have even been able to have this conversation and get through it without crying. Yeah, wow. And so how does forgiveness, how has that fit in? Is that a part of the, the healing yeah. to help you move forward? Yeah, absolutely. You have to, <laughs> because <laughs> otherwise it's like I'm holding on to this, this thing, yeah. you know, and I don't want to hold on. I didn't want to hold on to it anymore. So I just had to release all of the ill will I felt about my family member. I had to release all of the feeling and energies I felt about everything or anyone that I had gone through mm -hmm. um, just so that I can get to a, a place of pure peace. Yeah. Yeah. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. That's so beautiful. <laughs> and so the book is appropriately titled Women oh, Who man. Shine. <laughs> Women Who Shine. I mean, when I tell you it's divine timing, it's yeah. divine timing. I didn't even know I was going to tell this story. I didn't. I had a whole other story ready for my book chapter. Yeah. Um, when I first was approached about the book Women Who Shine, I was like, oh, that's interesting. My mom used to always call me her chocolate star. And now I'm shining. Now I'm in the book Women Who Shine. You know? <laughs> and uh, so I was like, okay. So I thought I was going to tell a very different story. And when I got on the phone for my, um, my call with Kate Butler, it's her book series. Right. And she says, okay, so, you know, let's just use it as a purging session. Just get everything out. You know, we may not use everything in the chapter, but let's just get everything out. I'm here. Just dump it all on me. And I was like, okay. And she goes, oh, let me say one more thing. Whatever you, we were thinking you weren't going to say, just go ahead and say, like, just get it out there and we will just build a, build a story from there. Yeah. So I'm going to be taking notes. She, you know, she's like, let me take notes. I'm going to be doing all these things. So just know, just whatever you want, just purge. Right. And I was like, okay. So as she's saying this, I already had my story. I had already prepped for the, for the time with her. I had written, I answered all the questions she sent. I was ready for this. And when she came back and said, and even say the thing that you don't want to say, and then that's when this story dropped in my spirit in that moment. And then I was like, oh, right now? Now I'm looking at God like, really? This, you want me to do this right now? I wasn't even prepared to do that right now. All right, all right. I got to be obedient. Right. So, <laughs> so I just started talking. And she was floored. You know, she was flabbergasted. And it was the most, it was the most healing moment for me. That was one of the most. The other, the first one was when I was on... I was on Fox and I was being interviewed about a production that I was a part of. And I just met Beyonce at the um, Tyler Perry's studio grand opening. And we took photos and those photos and videos kind of went viral. So it was like a thing like, Oh my God, what was it like to meet Beyonce? Yeah. And you know, I was like, it was amazing. I didn't know what I was going to say to her. I uh -huh. just got introduced to her and, and it just hit me in the moment. I kid you not. I just said to her, I'm so thankful for your song, Brown Skin Girl. Because it's helped me even now as an adult be even be proud of the skin that I'm in. Man, I just got to say thank you because I didn't grow up feeling like that about myself. And she was sitting and she got up and she was like, oh, my God, thank you for sharing that with me. That's why I wrote the song. And she gave me a hug. Wow. And she was like, you're so beautiful. This is what I want my children to feel. And we had this great, you know, earnest moment. And so as I'm sharing this moment on national television <laughs> my dad is watching and I talked a bit, just a little bit about colorism and, and why that song was so important to me and why I feel so even more empowered being in the skin I'm in about that song at this time and my dad called me and he said you know I just watched your interview and he said you know I got to tell you I never realized how affected you were by the things that you were going through he said but I want to apologize to you as your father because I should have done more. I should have protected you more. And I should have stopped the family member from doing that. We were just like, oh, that's just how she is. She's being funny. And he said, but that wasn't okay. And I should have done a better job as your father. And I'm sorry. <laughs> I lost it. That was an apology I did not know I needed. Yeah. 
And that just, oh man, I get emotional just thinking about that moment right now. But that for me helped my healing so much because it, I no longer felt alone in that. Because I used to be like, does no one see this? So this is just a joke. Okay, it's funny, but it's killing me on the inside. Yeah. You know? mm-hmm. And so for him to come all these years later and apologize for that, it spoke to the, the character of the man that my father is. He's amazing. But it also, it made me feel heard. It made me feel seen. Right. It made the little, when I say me, I mean like the little girl back then. It was like he was speaking to that little girl in the tub that didn't want to be dark, that would pray to be lighter so that she would have a better life. When in actuality, he made me this way for a reason. And I'm really proud to be in the skin that I'm in, but it took me, it took me a while to get here. Oh, it's so powerful. And I really appreciate you being so, so real mm-hmm. and, you know, personal about this. And it's not talked about enough, mm-hmm. you know, in the black community. It's not, yeah. about, it's not talked about enough. Okay. Um, you know, we have a lot of conversations, I think, in the black community, but that's not one that we have regularly. Mm-hmm. You know. Agreed. I, you know, I just saw this meme the other day on Instagram. Someone reposted and it said, I don't know who needs to hear this, but please stop telling your children, stay out of the sun, you're getting too dark. And I was like, whether that was meant to be funny or not, I'm like, that's so true because that's, mm-hmm. what that's doing is planting in your child's mind. Don't yeah. get too dark. If you get too dark, that's not a good thing. You get too dark, nobody's going to like you. you. get too dark, insert all these things here, right? Yeah. Don't let them stop normalize being dark and being black is beautiful can that be normalized yeah. yeah yeah you know but i'm i'm in the, you know i grew up in the south so you know in the south they fought for slavery far longer than everybody else in the mm-hmm. south the mindset there is completely different i mean i grew up down the street from people I, i've never walked foot in their house because they're like mm-hmm. oh you're too dark all the way up into college and i supposed to go to this girl's house to work on a project together and then she she we i see her at school like okay meet you at four and she was like oh, we got to go somewhere else. I can't do it at my house anymore. I was like, oh, okay, why not? What happened? She's like, my dad's going to be there. And I was just like, and I did not get it in the moment. And I was like, oh, what does that mean? And she's like, oh, he, he still, he loves a lot of brown paper bags. So nobody dark. But this is, I mean, this is unbelievable. I had never heard yeah. that before. Yes. Not modern times. I mean, I know. Modern you, times. Girl, yeah. I have mm-hmm. never heard that before in modern times. Absolutely. Oh, I've had. One of my girlfriends in college, she ended up marrying a guy who is really chocolate, as I say, or really dark skin, right? And she didn't know if her dad was going to walk her down the aisle and so he showed up at the wedding because he didn't wow. want her to marry him because he was dark. And I was like, wow. that's." And he walked her down the aisle with that most angriest face. Like, he was just like, I don't want to be here. And, you know, they're happy now. They have kids and all of that, but yeah, her family wanted to disown her because of that. That's, that's real. She's switching up the, they want to keep the color line pure is what the, the verbiage that's used. And we got to keep the color line mm. pure. So we want to, there's incest sometimes going on, but we want to make sure that we're continuously dating and marrying lighter skinned people. I mean, but that only goes back to slavery of course. and white culture that, you know, we just adopted. That is of course. horrible. That is horrible. But I have to acknowledge that my mom experienced some of that. She -hmm. was from Virginia. She's born and raised in Virginia. She's not living anymore. She would just tell me about her experiences sometimes. Mm -hmm. She had told me how when I was a baby, I looked like my father. I look mm-hmm. like his side of the family, but the older I get, I look like my mom. Mm-hmm. But she always wanted a girl. The first child she had, she miscarried at, at seven months. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, I had two brothers. And that was a boy. The first one was a boy. I had two brothers, older. So she always wanted a girl. Here I am a girl. And she was over my father's mother's house. That side of the family was really big you know, large number of people. And she said that my grandmother said to her, my father's mother said to her that I didn't look like I was her child. And that she never, that like that hurt her for the rest of her life. Mm -hmm. It hurt her for the Mm -hmm. rest of her life. Yeah. And I had a boyfriend who she misunderstood. I had made a comment that he thought that um, we didn't look alike. Because a lot of people, everybody say I look like my dad because I look like my dad. 
you know, mm -hmm. yeah. and, um, but she thought it was a color issue. And my only point in that is that that pain was still there. Mm -hmm. And so it didn't come up. You know, those are the only two times I really remember it coming up. But you know, it just goes to show how that wound is there. And my mom never, yeah. she never honestly felt close to my grandmother again after mm -hmm. she made that statement. Yeah, she said that. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah, words have power. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, words have power. Mm -hmm. They can either make you or break you, for sure. Yeah. Again, thank you so much for sharing yeah. that. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> So you are a working actress with so many TV and film credits. Yeah. <laughs> oh my well, gosh. Well, thank you. Oh, <laughs> it must feel awesome. When did you know that you, you know, wanted to be an actress? Interesting enough. My mom would say I've been acting my whole life because <laughs> when, I, when I was a kid, me and my cousins would always play pretend. We would watch movies or TV shows and we'd get up and we'd act out the whole thing, like the whole, all the time. Yeah. But back then, no one's thinking like, oh, we should cultivate that skill set and put her in an acting class. I remember a small town, like 75,000 people, there were no acting classes <laughs> at that time. And I didn't know I wanted to do that until I graduated college. And then when I graduated co college, it was like this little, little small voice that was just hitting me like hey you should try acting you should try acting you should try acting so finally I was like well let me at least try it and I fell in love with it and I absolutely loved it and it took and then from there I moved to LA I went from the real LA to LA you like that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I came to LA and then the journey began you know and the goal has always been as an actor I think for every actor they want to be a working actor you don't want to have to work two or three other jobs to try to support your passion because that stresses you out. You can't just be free to create and you know, mm -hmm. all these things. So now to finally be in a position where I truly am a working actor, like that before my entire life. And that, you know, I go from production to production to production. I am so grateful and it feels amazing. It feels took me a long time to get here, but it makes me that much more grateful for it. And it's more than a notion to just say, I'm going to move to California and go for it. I mean, so yeah. many people say that. That's pretty amazing that you made that happen. <laughs> <laughs> Thank did you. that take a people, while or it how did. <clears throat> oh absolutely the people who I came here with I'm, they're not they all went back home like I mm -hmm. came here by myself when I say came here with meaning people I met along the way that was here we got here roughly around the same time mm -hmm. all of those people are back home no one is still here all of them and so when they reach out now on Instagram and Facebook they're like oh my god man you did it you know kind of thing <laughs> but I've been in LA oh gosh like 18 years Gosh. Yeah, yeah. And, I'm Angelino. Yeah, totally. <laughs> and you're a regular on the Oval. I'm a regular on Tyler Perry's The Oval on BET Tuesday night at the 8 9 Central. <laughs> you like that? Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and have... I play Priscilla Owen, and she's, um, she's the resident staff supervisor for the show, and she runs the White House. Oh, so, I got to yeah, start right. watching the Oval. Oh, it's great. Right. Right now we're airing season two. We just shot season three. Um, I'm married to Sam Owen, who is over the Secret Service there in the White House. And it's, it's a White House drama. It's a soap, soapy uh -huh. kind of drama. It deals with the inner workings of the White House and, and the staff. We follow all of the staff home. And right now, I can say this because it's airing. It's, it'd be a spoiler for you. But right now, my husband is in an affair with the First Lady. Oh, Okay. Oh, it's so scandalous, darling. You have to watch it, Jeff. I <laughs> all I'm going to say. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. Oh, my gosh. Well, so is there an experience that stands out as, like, one of your favorites, like, early in your career mm. that, you know, just was like, I can't believe this? <laughs> yes. Uh, Grey's Anatomy. Grey's Anatomy. Ooh. I watched Grey's Anatomy from its inception. Right. Day one, when the interns walk into the hospital and they're all walking around, they keep, you know, you see that little clip for Grey's Anatomy, all my Grey's Anatomy fans out there. Yes. And every right time here. I watch, oh, right, right here. here. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which and episode were you in? Oh, gosh. It was years ago, but um, I don't remember the name of it. But I was, the, I was the patient that broke up the relationship between Meredith and Christina when Christina was on the show. Yeah. Yeah. What was you know, I need to get my I, character's I, I name? I just rewatched uh, several episodes on Netflix, I would say, mm -hmm. in the last year, maybe early in the pandemic. So I, yeah. that, that's fresh for me. Yeah. So okay. that, that, that was a really great moment. I always wanted to be on the show. And when I booked it, it was like, what? I get to be in the scene with Meredith and, and Christina. It was like, oh, I'm, I, this is it. 
And it was a great thing, you know, I was, I was a sick patient. Samantha Calder, I think that was my character's name. I think it just came back to me. And um, you hope when you go as a guest cast that, you know, the main cast are going to be nice and friendly and warm and charming because you've been watching them for years and you fell in love with them, you know? Yeah, yeah. And they were. I was like, praise the Lord. And um, <clears throat> they were very welcoming and open and they were so nice and friendly. So it was a great, great, great experience. Wow. And what so was that was the, one of my favorites. Can you describe what the production was like? I mean, was it very different from other productions you've been a part of? I just imagine mm -hmm. it being kind of unique. Maybe it's not, but. <clears throat> well, curious. it was in this way because it's a medical drama, right? Mm -hmm. So the set for that is going to be completely different. Uh -huh. And I really, you know, television makes everything look so much bigger than what it is. Yeah. Like, I know that in general, but then going to Grey's Anatomy, I'm like, oh, this hospital ain't even that big. <laughs> <laughs> like, I know better, but, you know, I was yeah. a fan. I yeah. was a fan actor being in there. But what I love that's different about that show is there are health professionals that are on the set mm -hmm. to help them be as realistic and as real as possible. Same for the guest cast. So if I have questions, I'm like, okay, my... I'm having, I don't even remember the storyline, but it was like, let's say my character's having seizures or all these things. How would I act that out? What does that look like? Like I can do, I've done, I did my own research, but here's a lady who's been in the field working this for 20 plus years. And so she'd come over and be like, it'd be more like this. She'd be like that. This is how you would feel. And then I'm like, oh, great. Mm -hmm. So that was really helpful working on a set like that. Because typically you don't necessarily have someone there, but then you don't necessarily need it to be that accurate to a disease or to an ailment of some kind, right? So working on a medical drama makes it a little bit different because you, what you're saying has to make sense, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. How you're moving your hand placement has to make sense. And then as the patient, how you're acting out this hurt, this pain and everything you're going through, again, has to make sense. So that's what made it a little bit unique <laughs> and different. Okay. And so you <clears throat> have a cosmetic brand. Is lipstick out? Lipstick, yes. So I launched a lipstick collection called... Mm -hmm. Taja V. Simpson Lipstick Collection. Mm. And um, it can be purchased at TajaVSimpson.com. So here's the, let me just give you the brain story for this since we're talking about colorism. One of the things that I would never do is wear lipstick because anytime I tried to wear a color, I was made fun of and different things like that. So subconsciously, I'm like, oh, I can't wear that. I'm too dark. I can't wear that. I'm too dark. So I just mm -hmm. would never do lipstick. And I had my mom and friends and makeup artists, makeup artist friends that be like, oh my God, you can wear any color. I'm like, girl, please, whatever. So this one particular friend, Crystal, she was always on me about wearing lipstick. And I just would be like, it looks great on you. It's not going to look good on me. So I would never do it. One day we're out, we're at a cosmetic store. And she's like, why don't you try something on? And I was like, oh my God. So this is like the umpteenth time now, right? She <laughs> asked me to do this lipstick thing. And I said, okay, you know what? I'm going to do it. Yeah. And when you see that it doesn't look good on me, the deal is you will never bring this up again. And she was you like, deal. I said, thank you. I put it on. I looked at myself, I got quiet, and I started to cry. And she was like, oh my God, what's wrong? Take it off, what's wrong, you don't like it, take it off. And I was like, I like it. And she was like, why are you crying? And I said, because for years I, I was always told I couldn't do this and I believed that someone else's opinion of me. And it was in that moment, uh, maybe nine? Nine years ago? Maybe eight or nine years. Mm -hmm. And in that and moment? So, and in that moment, I was like, I will no longer allow anyone's opinion to believe anyone's opinion of me. Yeah. And so I bought that color. It was like a deep purple. And then I went back and got a red and I went back and got a pink. And, and then I just started mm -hmm. being into color, lip color. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, I had this whole new view of myself. So when I decided to come out with the lipstick collection, I had all these different colors and we were launching for Valentine's Day of last year. And I was like, you know what? As we're picking colors, I'm like, I know I'm with the red and the pink. It's Valentine's Day. And then we ended up on the purple. Didn't even put it together in the moment when we were deciding on the colors. But it was purple, which was the first color I ever wore. It was red and it was pink. And so the purple is called Triple Threat. The pink is called Lights, mm. Camera, Action. And the red is called Leading Lady. And I'm super proud that I was able to get over my own, you know, shortcomings and then launch a brand and launch a line of lipsticks that other women can feel just as beautiful mm. in. Mm, yeah. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. So we can buy it at TajaVSimpson.com? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And it yes, will it eventually be in the stores? I don't know why I have Target on my mind. Come on, Target. I received <laughs> that. 
I yes. just have, I'm like, yes. I do. I have that on my mind. Like I, I and all along I've been like, I can go buy this at Target at the end of uh, April, right? That's what I'm I was thinking. I'm, I'm here before for it. Before we talk. I'm here for it. Yeah. <laughs> um no, right now it's just online. Okay. Um it's online and buy it'll be shipped to you. You know, we go from there. Okay. But um but no, but Target is interesting you say that because Target is something that's in the back of my mind. I'm like, oh, I want to get in Target stores. Yeah. So that is something I'll be working on. So that's thank wonderful. you for that. Well, I feel like, you know, you're going to you're gonna blow up even more for, you know, so many reasons. You should write a book. I heard you say <laughs> you wrote a book already about getting into the acting business. Mm-hmm. I did. I'd like to hear about that. I also think that this whole experience that you've talked about is mm-hmm. a book. That's a yeah. book. It's more than a chapter. That's a book. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I agree. I agree. Um, yeah. So I wrote, I co-wrote a book called Cracking the Acting Code, a practical step-by-step guide to becoming a professional actor. And the book did fairly well, but there will get questions all the time. Like, how do I get an acting? How do I get started? How do, how do I audition? All these different things. And so I'm only one person and I can't help hundreds of people at, you know, all at once. So now I'm literally working on a program. It's called the Working Actors Academy. Um, that's going to launch July 7th, where oh. anyone that wants to get into acting, anyone that wants to get started, literally, it's going to be a subscription course, $29 a month, where you can go and I will teach you all the practical steps and how you can become a professional oh, that's working really actor. Awesome. That's yeah. awesome. So I'm really excited about that. So the book kind of turned into a full on academy. Wow. <laughs> Well, um, before we wind down, I want to ask you the healing questions that I love to ask all of my guests. And it's related to the spiritual thread in you, which I know Mm -hmm. has got to be strong. So first, I'd like you to sort of speak to your knowing of God or your higher power. Yeah, yeah. So I grew up Baptist, came to LA, became Kojic. They let me in. You know, with Kojic, you got to be born in. But, you know, they let me in. Praise (laughs) the Lord for that. (laughs) Um, So I grew up knowing about Jesus and knowing about God. Mm -hmm. When I was very young, I had a very good, close personal relationship with God. As I got older, I started to really develop in that way. And as I was mentioning earlier, the hardships in my life led me closer and closer to Christ so that I can have a better understanding and how I can live how he wants us to live. There was a moment in time where I was like, I know too many Christians that are struggling. This can't be right. Mm-hmm. Every, the way everybody's doing it, that can't be the way. So I actually stumbled on this book called The Wisdom of Florence Scovel Shin. Um, and in the book, it's called The Game of Life. She has four different books. And The Game of Life is what really was the catalyst I needed from the Bible to the living, being the living word to actually the practicality of the living word. That was the catalyst for me that helped me truly understand the power of my words, the power of the subconscious mind, the superconscious mind, and your conscious mind. Mm -hmm. So absolutely, I love God. I believe in God, Jesus, the son of God. I believe in all of that. I also understand, have an appreciation for um, the law of attraction and what that means. Mm -hmm. I also have a appreciation understand that sometimes I use it interchangeably and people say God source the universe to me it's all the same Mm -hmm. I don't whatever comes out comes out but for me there's one God that's Mm -hmm. what I believe well do you have a spiritual practice for yourself Mm -hmm. I do so I meditate I do a lot of prayer and meditation and a lot of studying and I also listen to a lot of audio commentary whether it's sermons or whether it's Abraham Hicks whether it's Joe Dispenza Anything that deals with the renewing of your mind, yes. I listen to that on a very regular basis. I now know, you know, it's important not only what you feed yourself. Yes, I've always known that, but the intention behind it now is completely different. Mm-hmm. It's important what you feed yourself mentally, spiritually, physically, all of those things are very important. So I take care of the, the entire temple, not yes. just the physicality of the workout and want to be healthy and strong, but also the mental because... If your mind can do it, then your mm-hmm. body will follow, right? Mm-hmm. Even that, I need my mind to be the strongest thing. So I've had to learn to get my mind to be as strong as possible. That gets me through everything, yeah. through any doubt, any fear, any worry, any workout, whatever it is that, I'm, that may pop up. Because I still right. have moments of things that will pop up, of insecure moments, fear moments. But now I have the practical skill set of allowing myself, to, okay, I felt the thought, okay, I feel it. And anytime I get what I like to call a negative thought, I counter it with something positive. Right. At least right, five, at least right. five positive thoughts to counter the negative. I've stolen this or borrowed this 
phrase from Wayne Dyer, and I've been bringing it up to a friend because I know this is her mindset too. If somebody says something that is critical of you, I'm curious mm-hmm. how you, like, what is your response in your mind? Because my thought now is becoming, that's just how they feel. That's just where they're at. To not bring that on to me. Mm-hmm. You know? And I was just wondering, mm-hmm. do you have a practice? I do. I do. And it's something so simple. I just say the word cancel. Mm. Um, I like I cancel whatever that is because I now have a better understanding that everything is energy, right? I don't even want that energy on me, in my psyche, in my mental, in my, on me in any kind of way. It's almost like when you're cleaning your house, the energy feels different than when it's cluttered. You feel different in the same room when it's clean versus when it's not. So when someone is giving me unclean thoughts, I have to cancel that. Like, oh, cancel, cancel that. Don't even want, don't even want to take that on. And I never do in the moment (laughs) for sure. Yeah. I love that. Is there a time when you really feel the presence of God? When are those moments? Yeah. So I, for me, it's more so, I call it my, my heart coherence, right? Mm-hmm. I feel like I can call upon his presence when I'm literally in my heart coherence and I'm feeling something and I'm really being intentional about this feeling that I'm going for. Mm-hmm. That's when I can really feel the presence. Yeah. Like I can call, I can call it in at that moment. Now, there are other moments when things are happening and working out for me. And it's like, ah, that was okay. That's God. Okay. That's, that was okay. Thank you, universe. <laughs> I got that. There are totally moments like that that may happen throughout the day, throughout the month, throughout the year. But if I can just sit in my meditative state, mm-hmm. and as I'm meditating and sitting here and really focus, oh, I, I completely feel it come over me. Mm-hmm. 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 Is there a time, oh, let me say, I loved what you just said. Oh, <laughs> it was really thank powerful. You. Is there a time when you experienced a miracle or a blessing and you said to yourself, I had nothing to do with this happening. This was completely Uh, God. You know, here's one that comes to mind. This is right after my fiance left me. When he left me, I was in this condo by myself and I couldn't afford it solo. And so I was out in Orange County, which is about an hour, hour and a half, one way from where I live working. And I got a call for an audition and I was like, oh, I booked out. I, I can't. I'm out in Orange County. And we went back and forth like three different times. I wasn't able to make this audition. So then I finally I drive home. My fiance at the time had bought me a um, convertible BMW. And when I got home, I had taken my other car because it was work. And when I got home, the car was gone. And I'm like, well, where is my car? I'm calling the cops. I'm like, oh, my God, my car is stolen. Like a long story short, his mother had come over and mm-hmm. had it towed. So as I'm dealing with all of that, I get a call from my agent. She's like, they want to see you tomorrow for this Tyler Perry movie. It's called Boo 2. And I know this is like the third time, but I'm, I'm, they must really want to see you for this, Taja. If you could just, I don't know what's going on, but if you could just muster up some energy and just go in there, you learn lines very quickly, you can do this. And I was like, I remember telling her, Tracy, I don't even know how I can do this, but I'm going to try. She says, okay. In that moment, I got, on my, I got on my floor. I was laying on my floor in front of my fireplace. And I was, uh, at the time, I was attending this church. And the name of the sermon was The Game of Life. I was reading a book called The Game of Life. So I went home and I typed out that entire sermon. It was eight pages. So I felt like I was going through spiritual warfare. So I was in my house, like, for God, and I gave me the spirit of fear, but of poverty, and love, and a sound mind. The devil, you cannot come up in my house. And I'm in there, like, throwing scriptures out. And I'm in there just doing it, right? And so I ended up falling asleep on the floor. I get up at like six the next morning, like, oh, I got to learn these lines. It was eight pages. I got up, I learned it. I went, I did the audition, did an amazing job. And I said, you know what? I have auditioned for Tyler Perry. I went back and looked and I auditioned for him seven times. I realized at that moment, seven, was, seven is the number of completion. Eight is the number of new beginnings. So I said, I have to do it. What is my action step? What is my faith step that I can put out into the world that God will know? I'm believing for this one. This is my new beginning. I'm believing for this one right here. So I got up and I packed. Mm. I packed my Mm -hmm. bags as if I already booked the job, as if I already got it. And I was just like, okay. And I sat sat the bag by the front. If I needed needed something, I had to go in the bag and get it because I was ready to go. Yeah. I get a call the next day like, oh, they're still waiting for Mr. Perry to make his decision. I said, oh, okay, tell him take this. I'm already packed. I'm ready. So you made it to the audition. I made it to the audition. I did the audition. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it, it went okay. And then from there, once I told them, 
once I went to the point, once she called me back and they were like, they loved your audition. They're going to send your tape to Tyler Perry. We're yeah. just waiting to hear back from him. And yeah. I was like, tell them to take their time. I already packed. I packed my bags. I'm ready uh, to go. Yeah. And she was like, okay, okay, yeah. So the next day they called me and they said, okay, you're the choice. And when I tell you I shouted, I feel like that was God because I was in such a low state. Here it is. I'm struggling financially. I, have, I don't have enough money to pay for this condo by myself. He just up and left me in. I'm working an hour and a half away just to make ends meet. I'm working two full-time jobs. I am. Then I come home. My car is gone. Come to find out his mother came. I was like, take, take it, guys. I, I can't. I had nothing left. And you want me to be creative? I said, God, if this is for me, you're going to have to come in here because I got nothing. Lord, you're going to make me cry. <laughs> and he, wow. and the, I, I, I fell asleep praying. I uh-huh. woke up the next morning. I went in there, booked the room, as I like to call it. And then two days later, it was official. And it was a Wednesday when I booked it. That yeah. Friday, I was in Atlanta and I was filming Tyler Perry's Boo 2 on Madea's mm-hmm. Halloween. So that's the, I, that's the story story that came to mind I was trying to think of another one that was maybe shorter but it was like that's the moment that I knew I was at my absolute lowest and if God didn't give me any kind of strength I just I didn't have it in me to do it I just did not have it in me to do it but God and you know what that was surrender you know that's such a lesson for all of us Mm -hmm. because it's when I've been at those those moments of I'm exhausted yeah I give up that the thing happens But you at foresight before in the midst of it, you knew it was warfare, what you described. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, gosh, thank you so much. Well, okay. So one more question. And then I want to ask how people can get in touch with you, which I assume would be through your website. But what do you think that God calls you to do for yourself and for others through your work? Interesting enough, when I am... I feel like called to do a certain role, it always helps me personally in some way, which then invokes healing in me. Mm-hmm. When I was a member of West Angeles Church of God in Christ, I was also over the theater department. So for 12 years, I ran the theater department. We put up these ginormous, you know, Easter productions and various productions throughout the year. And our, our ministry was called the D- drama ministry, delivering righteous anointed ministry through arts. Luke 14, 23, go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in so that my house may be filled. Like that was our ministry scripture. And I realized through that process that this was my passion, but it was also my purpose. Because people will watch our productions that I either directed or or that I even written and directed or or directed and starred in, that people were getting saved from these productions. People were coming into church and we were giving them a word in our own creative way through the visual arts that was making people feel so compelled that on the Sundays that we performed were the most attended Sundays. Mm -hmm. And so I realized during that time, I was so passionate about it. I mean, I still am, but I'm so passionate about acting. I feel like I have a responsibility being on television every week. I feel like if I'm going to step into the shoes of this character and I got to breathe life into these words off the page, then it's my responsibility that I need you to feel something on the other side of the screen. As you're watching me, I don't take any job lightly. I decide, I choose which job I want to take. I choose what I want to do. I believe everybody's story is important to tell, but that doesn't mean I have to tell it. But if I'm going to tell this character's story, I'm going to do my due diligence. I'm going to do her justice. And I think that's what's made me so, I believe that's what's made me so successful in my career is because people watch me on television or in film. And a lot of the commonality is, ooh, I felt that. Ooh, girl, that was good. Ooh, I, I was right there with you. Like, they, they're, they're so connected. And then I'm not the lead in the over. I'm a regular, but I'm not the face of the show. But because of what I bring to the character, everybody's always so connected to Priscilla. That's the word and I that's would that's because use. of all of the work that I put in to this character, because I take it so, I just take it as a responsibility. It's my job. I don't, I don't take it lightly that I'm on television every single week. And we're the number one show on Tuesday nights. I'm on Mm -hmm. regular, basic, and cable television. No kidding. That's the word I was going to use before you even said it was connected. Like, you consciously want to connect with the viewer. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. That's your intention. Yeah. That's my intention. And, And, but see, intention is so powerful. I use intention for everything. If I'm going to be on the red carpet 
and I'm getting photographed, my intention is going to be when I step on, oh, I, whatever the affirmations is that moment. As these cameras are taking photos of me, oh, I'm booked. I'm just highly sought after. Producers love to work with me. I'm an amazing actor. I'm amazing talent. I'm wonderful at what I do. I'm so grateful for this moment. Like all these things are going yeah. through my mind mm -hmm. as I'm standing there smiling, taking these pictures, looking whatever. Because what happens is, and I tell this to people, what happens is as you're taking that photo or that headshot, and that's the intention you're putting into your eyes as going through the lens, when that photograph comes out on the other side and people are looking at you online or people are looking at the print out of the image and they're wondering why they feel so connected to you. They're wondering why it's like, oh, no, I got to catch this girl. Oh, I got to see this girl. Mm -hmm. Oh, this girl. This is the one. Yeah. It's because of the intention behind it. Yeah. You know, speaking of all of this, I did notice uh, that you had some producer or writer credits mm -hmm. on some of the productions. Is that something that you have a big interest in being behind the camera, too? Oh, absolutely. For sure. My business partner and I, his name is Michael McGowan. We are both from Lake Charles, Louisiana. We have a studio called Simpson and McGowan Studios. And the first production that we're actually doing under that umbrella is a documentary Through the Ashes, which is about the two hurricanes that just hit Lake Charles. Oh, no, really? Yeah. So there were two massive hurricanes, Delta uh -huh. and Laura, that hit Lake Charles that completely tore the city apart. Yeah. And a lot of people didn't realize the devastation of it, but it was... Right two massive ones back to back. So roofs were, you know, taken off homes and people were all displaced. And the city is, I mean, the city is, you see it, it's like, oh my God, I can't believe I grew up here. So he and I have gotten together. And so now we're, we're now working on a documentary that we'll be releasing next year. Oh, powerful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, how can people reach you if they want to get in touch? What's the best way? The best way is through Instagram. Well, everything. I'm on all social media platforms as at Taja V. Simpson, T-A-J-A-V-S-I-M-P-S-O-N. Um, the one I frequent the most is Instagram. And I do check my message requests and all my messages. So guys, send something in. In time, I will totally get back to you. <laughs> <laughs> I can attest to that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, Taja, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is going to be so powerful uh, for listeners. Uh, thank you. Just, I really, really appreciate how forthcoming you've been. Absolutely. I appreciate it. Thank you for your time. This has been, this was great. Thank you for joining us. Remember, you can listen to all of our episodes on traditional podcast platforms. Let's start treating each other better. Until next time, let's start healing.